Welcome back. This is the story of Robert Farquharson, a family annihilator who committed filicide, meaning he killed his own children, but left his wife alive, wanting her to live out her days with the unbearable pain of losing all three of her young boys. About an hour's drive west of the city of Melbourne lies the rural township of Winchelsea with a population of around 1,500. It's the kind of place where people tend to be born and raised there and marry people they know from the local area. Cindy Gambino had known Robert Farquharson since they were teenagers. After her previous boyfriend was tragically killed in a car accident, their friendship slowly developed into a romance. For Cindy, Robert was solid and reliable. By the time they married in 2000, they already had two children, Jay and Tyler. Their third son, Bailey, was born two years later. But it wasn't long before the relationship started to crumble. By all accounts, Robert was a bit of a mummy's boy who was still living at home when the couple started dating. He saw Cindy as strong and independent, someone who could look after him. Over time, he resented the children taking up so much of Cindy's time. He resented the fact that he was the one who had to go out to work and the financial pressure that a family brought. According to Cindy, Robert did nothing to help with the children. In fact, he began to take his frustration out on them. He would wind them up about one thing or another and wouldn't stop until one or all of them were crying. The oldest boy, Jay, would often run to his room and slam the door. Oh, this is going to wreck our marriage and I couldn't work out why a third child would wreck our marriage. And it wasn't the third child that wrecked our marriage, it was him. All I wanted to do was be married and have children, but I just married the wrong person. Cindy was losing respect for Robert and their marriage was falling apart. It was during that time that she met single father, Stephen Moles, a contractor who was working on their property. Mauls, who was a father of two, had just come out of a traumatic breakup himself. And while there was an attraction there, the pair decided to remain just friends. Cindy found comfort in confiding in Mauls, and on a number of occasions, Mauls actually told Robert that he should pull up his socks, stop whinging, and be the husband and father his family deserved. The couple officially separated in November 2004, amicably, so Cindy thought. But while Robert said he was moving on with his life, in reality, he was seething with anger. He felt he'd been gypped in the dividing of their assets. For example, Cindy getting the better of their two cars. He was infuriated that she was moving on with her life and was seen driving past the property at all hours of the day and night. His anger was spiralling. In July 2005, family friend Gregory King parked his car outside a local fish and chip shop. A few seconds later, Robert Farquharson pulled up alongside. The two men were standing outside their cars holding a conversation when Cindy pulled up and took the children inside the shop. Again, Farquharson began to complain about Cindy getting the better car. But what he said next made the hairs on the back of King's neck stand up. Farquharson said he was going to pay Cindy back big time. He was going to take away the things that meant the most to her. When King asked what he meant by that, Farquharson nodded his head toward the children inside the shop. King said, for God's sake, Robbie, don't even think things like that, let alone say them. They're your own flesh and blood. Unfortunately for Cindy and the children, Greg King thought Farquharson was just blowing off steam 
and would never actually hurt his own children. Less than two months later, on the 4th of September 2005, was Father's Day. And although it wasn't Farquharson's weekend for the boys, Cindy agreed that they should spend it with him. Farquharson was working that morning, so Cindy took the boys to visit her father before dropping them off to Robert in the afternoon. She'd had a recent photo of the boys blown up and framed for him. She asked Robert to have them home by 7.30 and left, having no idea that would be the last time she would see her boys alive. As Cindy prepared their clothes and backpacks for school the next day, 7.30 came and went. As time clicked by, she became more concerned. But since Robert said he was taking them to the KFC store in nearby Geelong for dinner, she thought perhaps time had gotten away from them. She was wrong. At around 7.15, Robert was driving back from Geelong towards Winchelsea. On the approach, the highway rises to a railway overpass and descends towards the town's outskirts. It was there, about three kilometres from the town centre, that Farquharson's car went off the highway. The road was dark and apparently deserted when the vehicle headed down a grassy embankment, crashed through a wire fence and plunged into a large rectangular farm dam. The dam lay in a narrow strip of land between the main road and the railway line. It was always full of water, even in years of drought. Local lad Shane Atkinson and Tony McClelland were driving along the Princess Highway. When they reached the overpass, a man jumped into their path, vigorously waving his arms. Shane swerved, braked and pulled over onto the shoulder of the road. The man was soaking wet. Getting out of the car, Shane yelled at him, Are you trying to kill yourself, mate? Robert responded breathlessly, No, no, I just killed my kids. Shane asked what he meant and Robert started babbling. Give me a lift back to Winchelsea. I've got to tell Cindy that I've just killed the kids. I put my car in the dam. Shane, who'd lived in Winchelsea all of his life, asked which dam. Robert didn't answer. Shane and Tony peered into the darkness. The night was cold, damp and dark. There wasn't a star in the sky. Robert said he'd done a wheel bearing. Then he said he'd had a coughing fit which had made him black out. He'd woken up and the car was in the water and he tried to get his kids out but couldn't get to them. Shane walked down the slope and scanned the paddock. He could barely make out the dam. We can get in there and try to swim down, Shane suggested. No, don't go down there, the shivering Robert replied. It's too late. They've already gone. I'll just have to go back and tell Cindy. Shane said they needed to get help, but Farquharson persisted. I've got to go to Cindy's. Take me to Winchelsea. Cindy heard a car screech to a halt in the driveway. By the time she opened the door, Robert was standing there, soaking wet and sobbing. Before she could react, he blurted out, I've killed the kids. They're in the water. I must have had a coughing fit and passed out. I woke up in the water. I couldn't get them out. Before her mind could even process what had happened, she was in the car with Robert and speeding toward the dam. Cindy called Stephen, but was too panicked to make much sense herself, only that the kids were in the water at the dam. Stephen reached the dam a few minutes after Cindy and Robert. He said he'll never forget that scene. Cindy was on the phone with emergency services. She was running up and down the edge of the dam, screaming, I need an ambulance. I need police. My husband's had an accident. My kids are in the water. Robert was leaning against the car, arms folded. 
It was 7.45pm and by this time the children had been in the water for 30 minutes. Stephen scanned the darkness and turned to Robert. Where are your kids? Robert replied, they're there in the water. Stephen waded into the dam, the chill of the water taking his breath away. He couldn't see a thing. He moved his arms in front of him, feeling ahead for signs of a car, signs of life, anything. After notifying police, Shane and Tony returned to the dam. Shane parked the car sideways to shine the headlights towards the dam and Tony jumped in to help Stephen. The sloping dam was far deeper than either of them had imagined and much more dangerous. The first ambulance arrived at 8.07pm, followed minutes later by Senior Constable Ted Harmon in a divisional van with a colleague from Geelong. Concerned paramedics immediately instructed the men to get out of the water before they succumbed to hypothermia. With the amount of time that had passed, police knew this was no longer a rescue effort, but a retrieval operation. The first thing that struck police was how calm Robert was behaving, not helping, not crying, just standing with his arms folded, watching the proceedings. He again said he'd had a coughing fit and must have blacked out. In the questioning, he turned around and said, no, I had a coughing fit. Now, at that stage, it got every alarm bell that I had going. There was nothing I, I could find to support what he, what he said. Both Cindy and Robert had been taken to hospital and the task of identifying the bodies fell on Stephen. Had a little... Had a little word to Jay. said a prayer and I remember saying to the coroner after that I walked back over to the coroner and I said this is shit I said uh he said yeah it's in all the 30 odd years or something that I've been doing this job I've never ever seen or been to anything as bad. I said, Tyler and Bailey are in the car, am I allowed to touch them? He said, no. Oh, okay, okay. And with that, I walked over to the car. I knew Bailey was gone, obviously, but I whispered in his ear, you know, you'll be safe. facts at the time were a vehicle had left the roadway, um, travelled um, across um, the embankment, through a fence uh, and into the dam. Um, the driver had got out, um, flagged down the car and gone back into town to raise the alarm where he didn't um, partake in any of the rescue effort. And as detectives, that sort of raised some flags in their own mind as to um, are we dealing with a tragic accident or is there something more um, that needs to be further investigated? So we winched the car out of the water. Of course, a huge amount of water ran out. The very first thing I saw was the ignition switch. Now, I thought it was very unusual that a person would, in the dark, have a coughing fit, drive out onto a dam and turn the ignition key off. 
and of course the headlight switch was turned off. So why he turned the headlight switch off sort of astounded me also. So the gear shift wasn't in the drive overdrive position, it was in the direct drive position. Um, and it was a cool cold night and the fan wasn't turned on. So for a person that was having a coughing fit and had a cold, um, not to have the heater on, I thought was really strange too. So a lot of factors in the car that, uh, and the three boys, of course, they were all out of their seat belts and that was, that was very disturbing to think that they'd got so close and just didn't make it. Cindy told police that she did not believe Farquharson intended to kill their children deliberately, saying, I believe with all my heart that this was just an accident and that he would not hurt a hair on their heads. I don't believe this is murder. But police thought otherwise. The investigation continued for three months before Farquharson was finally arrested on the 14th of December 2005. On the 5th of October 2007, on what would have been Jay's 13th birthday, the jury found Farquharson guilty and he was sentenced to three terms of life imprisonment without parole. Cindy broke down in court when the verdict was announced. Her mother collapsed and both had to be taken to hospital. After hearing all of the evidence, she now believed that her husband had murdered their children. To an incomprehensible, I can't believe that this person would hate me that much to want to murder his own children who he worshipped the ground they walked on. But in 2009, Farquharson successfully appealed his convictions and on December 17th, the conviction was unanimously overturned by three appeal judges. They were critical of the trial judge, the prosecution and the evidence of key prosecution witness Greg King, who had testified to the conversation outside the fish and chip shop. On December 21st, 2009, Farquharson was granted bail and released into the care of one of his sisters with a $200,000 surety. The retrial commenced on the 4th of May 2010. This time, Cindy became a voice for her children. And this time, another witness came forward. She hadn't come forward during the first trial, believing that the prosecution had enough evidence to convict. But when she read that Farquharson had been granted parole pending a second trial, she contacted police. She testified that she had been on the Princess Highway driving behind Farquharson on the night his car left the road. She said Farquharson's car was slowing down, then taking off, slowing down and taking off, as though he was looking for something. She decided to overtake him and saw that his attention was focused to the side of the road. He wasn't coughing, he wasn't unconscious. He was looking for a particular spot on the side of the road. The jury retired to consider their verdict and on July 22, 2010, the second jury again found Farquharson guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a 33-year non-parole period. I hate him with a passion. I don't wish death on him because I want him to suffer. I hate him more. I hate what he's done to me. Turn around. Hey, turn around. Wave to mummy. I hate him. <laughs> it's really affected my life greatly. Hugely. And it's destroyed her, totally. It's, it's a cruel thing to have to live with. When Chelsea Primary School, which Jay and Tyler attended, have built a reflection garden to commemorate the three boys. Ironically, 
It was seeing Farquharson's unrepentant face in the dock of Melbourne's Supreme Court in July that made Cindy finally realise she had to move on or his quest to destroy her life would have been successful. Cindy and Stephen were married on the 10th of October 2010 and now have two children together, Hezekiah and Isaiah. She wore a pendant with a picture of three smiling little faces. Cindy leaves us with some words of advice to parents. When two people separate, don't use the children as pawns because you might be that person's ex, but you're not your children's ex. Thanks for watching and remember to subscribe for more murder, mystery and mayhem. Until next time.